Hello guys, today we're going to be analyzing Never Let Me Go by Kazu Ishiguro. So this is quite a unique book. It's not really known, I guess. Um, and it is part of the IB like English language and literature and English literature syllabus that you can use for um paper two. Um, so let's begin. Um, so we're gonna be talking about the setting. Okay, so the setting of Never Let Me Go. So basically, if you haven't read the book, I do highly recommend that you read the book before the analysis because we're going to directly be delving into it. But if you haven't read the book, you can also tag along and just um, try to grasp uh, details and aspects analysis of the novel while we go on. So let's begin. So first, we're going to be talking about Hailsham, so the grotesque setting of Hailsham. So basically, Hailsham, it represents like a dual prison because it isolates its students both physically and mentally. So we're going to be beginning with that. So the physical isolation of Hailsham, surrounded by walls, because again, it had really, 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 really um, tall uh, walls, symbolizes a barrier, not just from sight, but from knowledge of an alternative life. Okay, so the clones don't know what they're missing out on. They don't know what's in the outside world. They really have no idea or no clue on what's going on. You know, it's like a barrier. This creates both a geographical, because again, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's like in the forest. Um, It's it's really, really far away from society um, and emotional confinement for the students, trapping them in ignorance about their fate as organ donors. Because again, we do know that throughout the novel, um, especially when these uh, students, they're coming of age, they really don't know what their purpose in life is. They don't know what they're meant to do. They don't know what they're missing out on. They're really just being indoctrinated by um, the school of Hailsham. The students' lack of awareness about their existence as cloned, destined for their predetermined role, because again, um, one of like the really, really, really key themes of this novel is um individual autonomy, right? And we do know that um the role is predetermined for them. So here we it also highlights individual versus society because as individuals we want the right, we want the freedom to really live our own lives. But in Hailsham, that's not the case because these clones they they have a predetermined role which is chosen for them by the society that they belong to, by society itself. So here that there's just a highlight between um, society and individual individuality. So this reinforces an emotional imprisonment, right? Because they're emotionally imprisoned because they really don't know what to do. They don't like a choice. They're confused, okay? And we're going to really be highlighting that when we analyze the quotes. They are denied personal choice and any possibility of escaping their grim future, effectively sealing their fate within institutions' walls, right? So they, so they, they, it's an imprisonment both physically and um emotionally because physically they're just confined by these walls they're in the middle of nowhere emotionally is because firstly they're literally um their whole lives they've been living clueless they don't know what they're missing out on they don't know what's going on in the inside outside world um and even if they are in the outside world they don't know how to function and they in fact they do actually have a choice some way somehow but they don't know that they do okay so that's really the whole point of the emotional uh you know emotional confinement right so now the ironic luxury and controlled existence. So we do know that Hailsham, it does have a luxurious setting, right? It's designed to appear nurturing and protective. So they do arts, they do different types of sports. You know, they really, they, they, they do have some sort of luxury in their lives. It's a sharp contrast with the bleak future awaiting its inhabitants, right? So the inhabitants are the students that live in Hailsham. So it kind of contrasts it because, okay, they're living this luxurious life. They're, have, they're, they're, they're learning, they're doing their arts. So they're getting a, a lot of like, let's say, um, luxuries that a lot of other students don't, like the average student doesn't do all of these things at school, I guess. Um, uh, but that's the whole point of Hailsham because uh, at the end of the novel, um, Hailsham is actually known to be a social experiment uh, which is like for the privileged donors because other donors, they all see Hailsham as this really, really, really luxurious place to be at because as we recall in the beginning when Kathy was actually nursing and taking care of that old man who was also a donor because Kathy, she ends up being a carer, okay, um, for her like... um kind of outstanding and unique personality, right? Um, so basically, this old man begins asking her about Hailsham and he wants to know about Hailsham and he wants to even feel like he's part of Hailsham and envision Hailsham just because Hailsham was like the dream for all of the um, donors. So it does have some, it actually is this the like symbol of luxury for the donors, right? 
And so this is the ironic juxtaposition reflect the clones controlled existence where they are offered opportunities for education and personal development, but only within the confines of their predestined roles, right? So, okay, they do have access to all of these amenities, but at the same time, it doesn't change the fact that they are these donors, they have these predetermined roles by society and there's nothing they can really do about it. So the controlled environment of Hailsham emphasizes the manipulation inherent in the student's upbringing, right? So they're being indoctrinated this whole time. The care and nurturing they receive serve as a facade for exploitation where their well-being is maintained only to prepare them for their ev eventual purpose of organ donation, right? Um, so basically, this whole time they're being prepared for organ donation, but it's so ironic because they don't even know it, right? So this is the situation in Hailsham. So now we're going to be discussing and analyzing our characters. So firstly, we have Kathy, who's the protagonist. Okay, so Kathy, so just to give you a quick sum up on Kathy, in case you didn't really read the novel or in case you forgot some of these details, Kathy is the main character. She is also, she grows up as a donor, but she ends up being a carer before being becoming a donor eventually, just because she has kind of a really patient and unique personality. She, she stands out from the rest. She's quite different from the rest, right? She's like, sort of a leader at the same time she has a certain a maturity level that's pretty high so she ends up being a carer right and she ends up hearing people's stories she even watches her friends Ruth and, and Tommy die um, and she even cares for them before their death and they donate before they donate their organs right so um, Kathy's inherent caring and nurturing nature remains consistent throughout the novel, emphasizing her role as a static character, right? So we have her as a static character. Her character does not change. Static means that the character does not change. They remain the same throughout the novel. The, this consistency contrasts with, the social, uh, contrasts with the social expectation that clones like her are merely tools for organization, right? Because in society's eyes, um, these clones, they're just like, they, they don't have this humanitarian nuance to them right they're, they don't have this new humanitarian aspect i mean so they're not really seen as humans whereas kathy she's really caring she's really nurturing right so this contrasts uh, the part that they're not really humans and that there's no human aspect to them right humane aspect to them so this is a contrast right so this is the reason that she ends up being a carer um her early caregiving for other clones, even before becoming an official carer, showcases her unwavering compassion, which transcends her assigned social societal role, right? So this is who Kathy is, and this is what the kind of person she is. Um, this enduring empathy highlights a central theme of individual versus society, where Kathy's consistent care stands as a quiet resistance to dehumanizing uh, utilitarianism. That defines the clone's existence, okay? Her humanity is asserted through these small acts of care, challenging the notion that clones are disposable commodities, right? Because this whole time, they're seen as these commodities. This is what society made them for. And remember that um, Madame, like this is because you remember that Madame would, uh, was the one who would always look at them with sadness in her eyes and everything. They would like show her her art, right? So Hailsham was a sort of project to, to, to show society that these kids aren't just donors they're just not they're not just spare body parts but they're really humans who um have these human aspects to them that everyone else has in society right and kathy is the actual proof for that okay and we're going to be discussing the art in the future slides kathy's commitment to caring despite the bleak and predetermined fate she faces serves as a subtle rebellion against the oppressive system that reduces her to a mere donor right her deep-seated compassion suggests that a personal qualities like empathy can persist even in the most dehumanizing circumstances making her static form uh, nature like a form of defiance and lastly by remaining emotionally steadfast kathy humanizes the system that seeks to stripe her of her identity again individual versus society so we're highlighting that once again her ability to retain the aspect of herself underscores the Novels and exploration of tension between the individual versus societal roles, revealing the powerful uh, the power of personal traits to uh, to confront and subtly challenge an otherwise overpowering system. Okay, so these are a bit highlight. They just like highlight and shed light on the same points. But basically, Kathy is a static character. Um, she really is physical proof that clones are humans. They do have humane traits, and that her her like consistency on being a humane her consistency on being caring and nurturing just showcase or at least rebel against um the the stereotype that these clones are just spare body parts right now we have ruth so ruth has always been a bit of a 
mean girl at to, to, a, to a certain point and we're going to be discussing her now so Ruth's denial and fantasy and fantasies about her fate as a clone contrast sharply with Kathy's more accepting and contemplative nature so her and Kathy they're quite different they're forward characters so if you want to talk about forward characters you can always talk about um Kathy and Ruth because they're quite forward characters with his behavior reflects a deep, often desperate desire to transcend her limitations and alter her destiny, emphasizing the human inclination towards hope, ambition, and escape and escape from reality. So we need to um, discuss two things here. So firstly, we do know that Ruth um, was quite always desperate to be the leader. She was quite um, always searching for approval around her. That's why she would often lie about things she was able or like capable of doing I guess and uh, Kathy would always know about these lies but she'd always brush, brush them off because Kathy was kind of more mature um so Ruth and Kathy despite being different and despite being four characters because again Ruth's desperation really contrasts uh Kathy's um acceptance acceptance right so um but the common thing between them is that they both show the human qualities right they both show how humane they are ruth is desperation and her drive to really fit into society and be part of society and be part of the group is what makes her human right whereas kathy's um nurturing and caring nature also shows how humane she is right kathy on the other hand represents resilience and the capacity to find meaning within the constraints of an in 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 inescapable fate underscoring the ex existential tension between acceptance and denial so Kathy resembles acceptance and Ruth resembles denial, right? Which makes them four characters. Um, this, the discovery of the abandoned boat by Kathy, Tommy, and Ruth symbolizes their own eventual obsolescence and the in, in, inevitability of their fate as clones, right? So this just shows that eventually they're going to be these clones. Eventually they're going to donate their organs. Eventually they're going to die. Ruth's pragmatic reaction to the boat contrasts with Kathy's more reflective response. Uh, emphasizing the, the differing ways they cope with their circumstances. Ruth is practically hi uh, practically highlights her attempts to remain grounded in the reality of their existence, while Kathy's reflective nature allows her to ponder the deeper implications of their shared fate. Okay. So now we're going to be discussing Tommy. There's not much deep analysis about Tommy, but we do have to discuss him. We do have to know who he is, just because he is um Kathy's best friend. He is part of the trio, Kathy, Ruth, and Tommy. They're all a part of a trio. They're all in the same boat because, again, they're all going to die because of their predetermined fates by society. They all deal with their fates quite differently. They all find out in a different sort of way, and they all deal with that differently. Um, and Tommy does cause some, quite some clashes between um, Ruth and Kathy just because um, they both kind of wanted his love at some point because he was the male in the street and they were both females. So you can always see that there's tension just because of Tommy. So there's always tension between Kathy and Ruth. Tommy's eventual acceptance of his faith, despite his early hopefulness, mirrors the broader theme of inevitability of their predetermined world. His development from emotional outbursts to more reflective and resigned demeanor reveals his internal growth and his confrontation with the hor harsh realities of their existence. So Tommy kind of resembles the theme of acceptance. Um, he kind of accepts his fate. Um, and we can also talk about how he's quite a dynamic character, even though he isn't like a really star character, isn't really that important in the novel, but he is quite dynamic. He quite changes because at the beginning of the novel, we can always see that um, Tommy has quite some tantrums, but he ends up changing towards the end. He ends up becoming more accepting. Okay, and even Tommy and Kathy, they try to really um, extend their lives by getting married because they have some sort of true love. So they try to find a way to do that. Um, they, 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 they convince themselves that that rumor is true. It wasn't true. But um, Kathy and Tommy try to um, get cheat the system some way, somehow, and that does not work. So now we have Miss Lucy. So Miss Lucy is quite important in this novel. So Miss Lucy stands out as a guardian who struggles with the moral implications of how stu the students are raised. So again, she has a moral compass. Unlike the other guardians, she feels uncomfortable with the way Hailstrom conceals the truth from their students, believing that they should be made aware of the future as organ donors. Her discomfort highlights the theme of ethical responsibility and the moral ambiguity surrounding the clone's existence. Okay, so here, this is very important. We have to talk about ambiguity. Ambiguity is something really, really big. And never let me go because it just really highlights the dystopian uh, 
aspects of Hailsham as a setting. So Hailsham is quite dystopian. How the 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 like the clones they never really know about their fate until a while later. They're kind of being experimented with. It's a sort of social experiment. Everything's ambiguous. Everything's a secret. Everything has um a connotation some way somehow. So it kind of just demonstrates the dystopian aspect, right? The ambiguity. Miss Lucy's eventual the eventual departure departure from HM symbolizes her disillusionment with the school's methods and her inability to continue supporting a system. Them, she finds morally reprehensible. Her exit underscores the novel's exploration of the tensions between individual morality and institutional conformity, or in other words, it also, the, also has to do with individual versus society, because as an individual, Lucy disagrees with the regimes of Hailsham, with the system itself, and she thinks uh, and believes that the, these clones should know about their lives, what's waiting for them, um, and their destinies in general, whereas the institution of Hailsham is not following that system. They're not telling the clones anything and they're keeping them in the dark this whole time. So we can also see um, individual versus society. In this case, society is Hailsham. Um, so yeah, now we're going to be discussing Madame. So Madame is revealed not to just be an administrator, but the co-founder of Hailsham along with Emily. Okay, so this is what I talked about previously, a revelation that recasts her earlier interactions and the collection of the student's art in a more complex light. This development on unveils her as a character of moral depth involved in ad advocating for clone rights and acknowledgement and uh, acknowledging the cruelty inherent in the society's use of clones as organ donors okay so basically madame is quite a good character she's um she's basically um one of the good ones okay she's a sort of hero to a certain extent because she tries to to like she she has a positive cause. She has a good cause. She's trying to you know highlight and shed light on this cause. Um, she's trying to illustrate that these clones are more than clones. That they're human. They have humane aspects to them. She does this in many ways. Um, despite her position and efforts, Madame expresses a, po a poignant sense of regret and powerlessness in changing the fate of the clones, yet she fails. Again, individual versus society. So as an individual, Madame's trying to, you know, overpower this, but she isn't. Her character transitioning from uh, authority to advocate and then to a figure of embodying regret highlights the novel's explanation of limit limitations of individual agency, agency within oppressive systems. So all of these, like individual morality and institutional conformity and individual agency with oppressive systems, they all fall under uh, the umbrella of individual versus society, right? Madame's complex character or uh, arc reflects Ishiguro's broader commentary on the ethical dynamics in the face of scientific advancement and the value of life in a dystopian society. Again, so here we go back to dystopian society because again, this has to do with the scientific advancement, right? Because the world is advancing so fast, they're able to create such clones which are able to, you know, replicate body parts and donate them to whoever needs them because this is their job as clones. But this scientific advancement, what does it, you know, really leave out? It leaves out. Um, it leaves out the moral aspect, right? So, with um scientific advancement, we have moral the morality, you know, decaying. So morality is decaying. So this is like sort of like the novel Frankenstein, where there's like scientific advancement, but there's there's an expense to that, right? So now we're going to be just talking about the theme. So we have four main themes, the individual versus society. This is where I talked a lot about it. Memory and nostalgia. So we're going to be talking more about this in the like in the quotes, coming of age and identity. So all of these really fall under the main themes of Never Let Me Go. So now quote analysis. So this quote, it's really important. It's not that I smoked. It wasn't good for me, so I stopped it. But what you must understand is that for you, all of you, it's much much worse to smoke than to ever was for me you've been told about it your students you're special right okay the use of you and repetition so basically um we have you 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 right so the repetition of the word you it emphasizes that the clone separation um uh, basically, it just like it shows the separation between the speaker and the 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 clones. It makes them feel like they're personally addressed and isolated. This highlights their unique but tragic tragic circumstances as both subjects of care and exploitation. So at the same time, yes, they are caring for them. But at the same time, at Hailsham, they are exploiting them, right? So it's just kind of ironic, and you can tell that there's like a sort of separation between the speaker and the spoken to, right? 
So addiction, so the addiction used, the word special. So the word special is ironic, suggesting that, uh, the, suggesting the importance while also hinting at clones tragic fate as organ donors. It mirrors HM's du du duplicity, appearing nurturing, but built on exploitation, like I previously mentioned. So here the word you're special, kind of like, kind of is like in uh, direct and it's ironic because she is telling them that they're special meaning hinting that they're different but special in a quite different way you know it has a negative connotation there now there's also ellipsis ellipsis are like these three dots here like this pacing when she talks you know she really stops when she talks she takes a break um and that just it suggests a hesitation or like a withheld truth reflecting the moral ambiguity of the speaker. Again, ambiguity is something big in dystopian societies. These pauses imply ethical uncertainty adding to the tension, tension surrounding the clone's grim reality. So again, we have repetition once more. Um, the repetition of the word must. Okay, so you have here, you must. Um, the word must emphasizes uh, compulsion and the lack of choice. Um, mirroring the clone's lives of enforced rules and predetermined futures just underscores the conflict between individual desires and societal demands. Again, the same theme. It's always individual versus society. In relation to settings, so the, the quote reflects Haitian's contra contradiction. Clones are cared for, but only to serve their ultimate purpose as donors. They are valued not for themselves, but for what they can provide to others. So again, you can see the paradox. It's a sort of paradox. Now you have the second quote. I keep thinking about the river. Somewhere with the water moving really fast and these two people in the water trying to hold on to each other holding on as hard as they can but in the end it's just too much the current's too strong they've let go drift apart so basically this is my favorite quote and never let me go i use this in most of my analysis as a student but basically the current is a metaphor for fate a metaphor if you know what it is it's just like it compares two things without using a comparison tool so without the words like and as the river's current symbolizes the unyielding forces of society and fate that the characters face. This unstoppable force mirrors a societal system that dictates the clone's lives destined for organ donation and early death. The resistance reflected in the title Never Let Me Go underscores their desperate wish to hold on to life in each other, despite knowing their efforts are likely futile. Okay, so basically this just shows that the that the river's the river and the current is like, like the two people in the river. And the current just like depicts the um the the situation of these clones because like these clones they're trying to hold on to their lives as much as they can, but like the current the the society's force is just too strong, the toll HM has on them and the power and control HM has on them is just too much. It's too strong, just like the current. Hence, they end up um you know drifting apart. They end up drifting apart from life. They end up losing their life, drifting apart from it because. They just really don't have that control. Struggle and connection. The imagery of two individuals trying to hold onto each other against uh, the river's force reflects the character's struggle to preserve their relationship. This struggle, despite the inevitability of separation, echoes the title, comparing the deep human need for connection and the pain of an eventual loss, right? Lastly, it's foreshadow and the in in inevitability of separation. So basically, this is foreshadowing the future just because um, these, just like these two people had to drift apart, the clones will eventually have to drift apart from their lives. The analogy also, so it's also an analogy, you guys, also foreshadows the character's eventual separation. Just as the river forces them to let go, so too are the characters compelled to surrender to their societal rules, leading to their separation. The title's tone of resignation and loss suggests an awareness of inevitable separation, yet with lingering hope of the fight, right? So there is some hope because they are trying, they are pushing, they're trying to go against the current, but they just count and then they end up letting go. So the characters end up letting go of each other and they end up letting go of life right so our last quote analysis is we all know it we're modeled from trash junkies prostitutes winos tramps convicts maybe just as long as they aren't psychos that's what we come from we all know it so why don't we say it so here the words prostitute winos tramps and convict they all form a lexical cluster this is sort of an advanced analysis but basically lexical clusters they're all like they all stand for one thing that underscores societal disdain, right? So stuff that are really ugly in society, ugly aspects of society. So like it's a lexical cluster for ugly parts of society, technically. Um, 
so prostitutes, winos, drums, and convicts, um, each were heavily laden with connotations of degre de degre de de degradation and disposability because, again, they're degraded. It's something ugly. It's something people look down upon. It's something disposable. It's something easily accessible and easily thrown away, something unwanted, right? Um, just like the clones are. These terms not only highlight the perceived low status of the clones, genetic or origins, but also metaphorically reflect how society values the clones themselves. Again, it just showcases their really, really, really low values. They're only seen as spare parts, useful only to the extent that they do not possess a threat. With this rhetorical question, we all know it, so why don't we say it? Acts as a provocation, challenging the clones to acknowledge what they tactically accept about their origin from society's rejected members. This question exhibits the collective denial about their origins, portraying a broader societal tendency to overlook uncomfortable truth, right? Um, so here, together, the harsh diction and the probing question vividly captures the clones' internalized struggles with their identities in a society that sees them as secondary, right? So here we see their coming of age, how they're starting to understand who they are in life, who they are in society, using a urging, um, a, a urging a confrontation with harsh realities of their existence. The dialogue is a poignant illustration of the broader theme conflict between individual and societal rules. But again, we also see some... Um, coming of age where they start just realizing what's around them and who they really are and their identities and what society sees them as. So now we have symbols. So the first symbol is the title itself, Never Let Me Go, so the title of the novel. So the literal implication of Never Let Me Go, the title suggests a plea to hold on to life, relationships and fleeting happiness to this despite grim realities. And this is the truth. So Never Let Me Go, They never. Uh, this is the same thing that the clones are trying to do. They never want to let go of life. So, yeah, this is a literal implication. Thematic depth, it captures themes of memory, loss, and the human desire for connection, symbolizing the character's struggle against inevit inevitable morality. Um, emotional and psychological resonance, so the title reflects the deep, complex bonds of the characters, highlighting their needs for attachment and the fear of abandonment, again, because we can always see that, especially between Kathy and Ruth, and how they always kind of, sort of, you know, fought for Tommy's affection. Reflective of narration and memory, so this has to do with the theme of memory. The title resonates with the uh, narrator's act of remembering, symbolizing the hope that memories will persist despite life's uh, transients. So this um uh, transcends. So basically, this has to do with like how Kathy here. So this is very important. I didn't discuss this throughout this video, but basically, this has to do with memory and how Kathy. White recalls her memories in such a weird way because Kathy is the the narrator, right? Um, but the, the thing is that she really can't remember her thoughts quite right. She's an unreliable narrator. She can't even remember the exact location of Hailsham. And we just here see memory and how her memory is really um quite um in 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 like it's really quite unstable. It's not really right she really can't recall the events uh, quite right and this just demonstrates her really internal uh, internal uh, internal state like her 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 mental health isn't doing well um and so is her physical health at that point but her mental health isn't doing quite well which really determines how how depressed she is and how her how 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 bad her well-being is right um, so we can tell that um, Kathy is an unreliable narrator. Universal appeal. So the titles emotional uh, undercurrents are universe, uh, universally relatable, connecting personal loss and attachments to broader human experiences, right? Uh, so then we have the Judy Bridgewater tape. So the Judy Bridgewater tape, uh, and particularly the song Never Let Me Go. So there's also a song that Kathy used to listen to called Never Let Me Go. It symbolizes the profound conflict between the clones' deep uh, human-like emotions and the cold utilitarian purpose assigned to them as organ donors. So the song's lyrics resonate with the character's longing for love, connection, and a normal life. So again, what makes them humane? Contrasting sharply with the harsh reality of their existence, where the humanity is acknowledged only to the extent that it serves society's needs. Again, spare parts, there are spare, uh, spare parts. This dichotomy emphasizes the cruel irony at the heart of the novel. While the clones experience genuine human emotions, their lives are systematically reduced to me means to an end, a brutal reminder of the predetermined and dehumanizing roles imposed on them again, individual, individual versus society. And at this point, we see that. Um, and there's a there's an event throughout the novel. It's a really important event where Kathy was actually dancing to the song and imagining that she has a baby, 
and um, Madame, and then at the end, when like Kathy, Kathy views Madame crying and watching Kathy, and here Madame's just crying because she knows that Kathy has this humane aspect about her. She sees Kathy as a human, but she's so sad that society can't see Kathy as a human, right? And it's so ironic because here Kathy doesn't know why Madame is crying. So the last slide, guys, so the art. So at HM, the creation and donation of art symbolizes subtle preparation for the students' future as organ donors. By learning to part with their artistic creations, students are gradually conditioned to accept the inevitability of parting with their organs. And this process goes beyond biological preparation to also instills the psychological and emotional acceptance of their faith. So this is like, you see the, the, the dystopian aspect. So all of this stuff, they really don't know. They don't know the purpose of what they're doing. They don't know what's happening behind the scenes, right? The act of donating art becomes a pre precursor to the ultimate sacrifice of organ donation, reinforcing a conditioned sense of selflessness that makes the reality of their predetermined role seem natural and unavoidable. Again, all of these are dystopian elements. And I discussed Madame and how she would make them also um, make these artworks to just show their humane aspect and prove that they're humans to make the social experiment really uh, be a success but in the end it didn't end up working so this is it thank you so much guys for watching if you want a deeper analysis and you can always ask me for a tutoring session and we can focus on whatever you guys want to focus on and have a deeper analysis this is just something i would like to share in the ibx Sense academy um, youtube channel if you have any questions please comment down below you can always join my english literature google classroom um, I love you guys so much. Please like and subscribe so I can continue making such videos um, and I can see some support from you guys and I can see if you guys really like these videos and like the analysis. So thank you so much guys for watching. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of your day.